This is Learn From Others, where we interview a cross-section of successful individuals so you can learn from their experiences, achievements, and even their mistakes. We ask four questions that will educate and inspire. Greg Stanley will be your guide as we join our guests on a journey from adolescent daydreaming to success in today's world. Join us on this adventure as we learn from others together. Welcome to Learn From Others, where we help others succeed by sharing success. I'm very excited to introduce our special guest, Dr. Linda Alvarez. Linda, how are you doing today? I'm good, thanks. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, no problem. Thrilled to have you on. Well, before we find out what you're actually doing today, if you would, could you please tell me, what did you want to be when you grew up? So I always knew that I wanted to be a doctor when I uh, when I was little. Um, I... I'm Cuban and Italian, which I guess means I eat carbohydrates all of the time. <laughs> um, but I grew up in Inwood, Washington Heights um, as a kid and taking care of my Cuban grandparents. And I remember even as a kid taking them to the doctors and everywhere else in our community spoke Spanish and the doctor didn't. And I was a medical translator when I was like seven or eight. And I remember thinking, why why doesn't this doctor look like me or can speak the language? And that really kind of led me into thinking about medicine. Um, and then my mom is a neuropsychologist, has more postdoctorates than I can even count. Um, and actually, she just finished medical school last year at 61. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> and so I always saw her as a role model, constantly studying. And she kind of showed me the aspect of medicine that wasn't the fun blood and guts, maybe not fun for other people, but I think people in medicine kind of think of that. Right. Um, and she, you know, really showed me kind of how uh, medicine is really like a big puzzle and understanding all of these little in intricacies and how they work together. And you're really a big detective as a physician. And I thought that that was so cool. Um, so that really kind of led me into thinking about medicine as a career. Yeah, that's really cool that your mom went back and continued to continue her education. And just a little shout out to my dad, who actually got his nursing degree when he was 58, I believe, after he retired from being an educator. So you can always go back. You can always go back. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. Well, what was one of your favorite subjects or hobbies while in school? In school, I I was definitely a mathlete, less on the athlete, more on the math. <laughs> <laughs> and I was part of the the math team and the chem league. Um, so I was I was you know slightly nerdy, but I also too really loved a uh, debate team. And so I was part of Junior Statesman of America, and that allowed us to understand kind of how government worked, what was lobbying, um, the political structure, and have you actually debate. And I thought that was so cool. Well, could you introduce us to your special guest, the little dog in the background? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So that's uh, Elvis and Bootsy Collins. They are brother and sister. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, cool. Well, now, what was your first job, the one where you felt like you had some responsibilities and you really wanted to perform well, like your first real job? My first real job, I actually, I started working in... Um, a neuropsychologist's office when I was about 17 and I was doing so well that I became the office manager <laughs> Wow! and I it was interesting because that was really the first time where I ended up getting a lot of responsibility while still having to be in school and studying um, and really trying to I, I call it triaging time but prioritizing my time and figuring out what what worked well in my schedule. I learned to through, kind of throughout that whole process that I like to study a lot differently than others and really learned how to be a good student during that time. But that was that was the first time and it was interesting too, it was in the medical field as well. And so it gave me a little insight into the outpatient life of a physician, which is you know, having a relationship with your patients that you understand them, their whole family, um, you really have a connection with them. And sometimes you miss that when, when you think of medicine, you think of the hospital setting. And so I really enjoyed that as well. Wow, that's really cool. So you wanted to be in the medical field somehow at a young age, which is really amazing. And now you're doing that as a 17-year-old while still in school. So tell us, what do you do today? Are you in the medical field? 
I, I am. So I am a board certified family medicine physician, um, and I also did my fellowship in hospice palliative. Uh, currently, though, I work as the National Secretary Treasurer um, for the Committee of Interns and Residents, which is the largest resident physician union in the country, representing 16,000 doctors, um, soon to be 20,000 by 2020. Uh, and we are actually the largest doctors union in the country in general, not just residents. And part of what I do is I advocate uh, for patients uh, that we see in our communities, uh, making sure that there are laws so they can access proper health care. Um, I also to advocate on behalf of the residents. And so we do a lot of the contract negotiations to make sure our residents have fair salaries and safe working conditions. And then too, I get to do a lot on the political spectrum. Um, so making sure that there are safe working conditions for all healthcare workers and making sure that patients of whatever nationality, whatever race, um, whatever ethnicity are able to get access to care and good care. Um, so that's really exciting, and I kind of never saw myself doing this. It, it kind of is a step away from the clinical aspect of medicine, but I still get to use medicine every day in what I do. So speaking of which, you said you really didn't see yourself doing this, and one of the goals of this podcast is to share different careers that students would never know about, and this is one of them. So if you could tell me, how did you go from your time in college and getting into the medical field to your job today? Like, how, how'd you make that transition? How'd you find out about it? Yeah, so I, um, I had a really uh, unusual course um, education-wise getting to be a physician. So I knew at a very young age, like you said, that I wanted to be a physician. And so in New York State and, and a few other states around the country also offer this. Um, but there was a seven-year bachelor's MD program through the City College of New York called the Sophie Davis School of Biomedical Education. And what that program is meant to do is to bring minority students into the field of medicine and into primary care, especially in New York State. Um, and so I started within that program. Um, it was very, very intense. Um, and usually these programs are, we did our undergraduate in about two and a half years and then straight into medical school. And it was very fast. For me, I needed to take a little bit of time away from that. So I decided during, in between my second and third year of medical school to actually do a kind of independent study on complementary medicine, um, yoga, and Ayurveda. Um, and during that time, I helped run a grassroots yoga foundation in Harlem where called the Urban Yoga Foundation, where we brought um, yoga meditation services to the kids. And it really kind of introduced me not only to the form of complementary medicine, but kind of grassroots efforts and, and what it was like to go out into the community, to talk to people, to find out what they needed and how to facilitate that. And that was a really, really big tool for me too, going back into my third and fourth year of medical school. I was really able then to relate to my patients and have a comprehensive understanding of what their daily struggles were. And I also knew how to hustle. Um, I knew how, <laughs> like I knew how to get things done because when I worked for the Yoga Foundation, I mean, we started. It was me, the founder, and two other staff, and we hustled to grow to about a staff of forty-five um, trained yoga teachers and practitioners that we had in New York City public schools. Um, and so, you know, that within itself was kind of an unusual course. Um, I then went to do my residency in family medicine at the University of Miami uh, Jackson Memorial Hospital, um, primarily because I really wanted to do family medicine in an urban community, primarily to working with immigrant populations. And so Miami was an ideal place uh, to do that. And I continued my career into hospice palliative. But while I was a resident, there were, you know, I loved my residency. My residency was a fantastic educational experience. But, you know, in any sort of situation, you notice how, as a resident, you are the boots on the ground. You see what's directly affecting your patients. And I felt as though I didn't have a voice. The union, which is the Committee of Interns and Residents, was established already at, at the hospital I was working at, and I started to get more involved because I had noticed these things going on with my patients, um, different things with my colleagues, and them getting burnt out. 
that I really wanted to address. Um, and so joining my union and then um, becoming a representative really gave me that outlet to express what was going on and to have a seat at the table. Um, and I noticed that as I kept going forward was that a lot of physicians we go into medicine because we love our patients and the patient comes first. Um, however, we've lost track of making sure we're taken care of. And so now as uh, the National Secretary Treasurer for CIR, the Committee of Interns and Residents, I'm able to be advocates for my co-residents that are working 24, 30-hour shifts, working 80-hour weeks to make sure that they are able to get the, the basic needs that they that they require. And also, too, I mean, they're working 80 hours a week, so to be the person um, who has the capability to speak on their behalf is really important. Right. Yeah. On our pre-call, you mentioned you had quite a different career path, and you are correct. <laughs> I never thought yoga would be part of it, so... Yeah very flexible in my career path, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, it really speaks to the, you know, you learn something from it. So it kind of shows no matter what direction you go in, there's an obstacle that changes your career path. It still could be an opportunity to learn and grow and help you in the future with what you're trying to accomplish. So that's really cool. No, thank you. Now, what is your typical work week like? <laughs> so my work week is pretty interesting. Um, CIR, we represent residents all throughout the country. We are in Florida, D.C., Boston, uh, New York, New Jersey, New Mexico, all over California and expanding um, throughout different states around the country as well. Um, part of what I do now is the new organizing. So um, I work with residents who are interested in having the Committee of Interns and Residents represent them at their hospital and becoming part of the union. Um, so I go out to those shops and I really help the residents understand what it means to have a collective voice, what's the work that's required, um, and help within the leadership training for that. Um, I also, too, um, go out and do a lot of political work. So actually, um, this week I'm going to Sacramento to, to speak on behalf of the nurses' union um, to make sure that they their rights are being protected, um, as well as I do a lot of the contract negotiations for, for the residents, um, and I help them understand what are things that they can ask for and how it can better facilitate the care that they're giving to their patients. Um, so it's really, it's interesting. It is a mix of, I kind of know where, what I'm going to be doing, but never what any day is going to bring me, and I could be anywhere. I could feel like Carmen San Diego half the time. It could be anywhere <laughs> in the country. <laughs> right, right. Well, it keeps the job exciting and fresh. You're not stuck behind a desk eight hours a day, right? No, definitely not. And you know, it, it's interesting. I never, you know, I, I explain my job to people and they, they say that that must be exhausting. And I never think of it as exhausting because it, this to me isn't work. This is something that I truly love doing, that I enjoy doing and and it is an experience that I am so grateful to have that you know when you were asking me what a typical week was like I was like you know it's hard to distinguish like the the work aspect of it because I love doing it <laughs> right that's awesome that's really great if you're able to do what you love one of my previous guests she said my dad said do what you love because you're going to do it anyways and by that he meant it, it will be a, maybe it'll be a hobby but if you can make it as your profession you'll never go to work a day a week in your life so oh, yeah that's pretty cool as a reminder you can check out all previous episodes at learnfromothers.org and if you're an educator or a student you can search for podcasts by career cluster so Linda we learned what you wanted to be when you grew up, which was something in the medical field, and what you do today, which is something in the medical field. So congratulations. That rarely happens. Right. <laughs> yeah. So looking back, what would you do differently? Um, I think looking back uh, is really believing in, in myself um, and believing that it's okay to take an alternate path. I think when I had decided that I wanted to take that um, year of academic leave uh, to explore what I wanted to explore, I got a lot of pushback. And it almost made me second guess if what I was doing was the right thing. Within a few months, I got published in, in different literature magazines about being the first medical student to ever take this kind of break. And it actually pivoted me forward. And so 
if you believe that this is something that's going to work for you and that's going to be the best thing for you, go 100% towards it. And I think that that's, that's the biggest piece of, you know, what I would have done differently is just not second guess myself, really have been confident and sure of myself. But hey, that's right. what you learn in time. <laughs> right. That's true. That's true. Well, now let's make the assumption someone in our audience wants to do what you do. You can define it as you will, because I know you've done a lot of different roles. Uh, what advice would you give them? I would say that um, if you are interested in pursuing a career in medicine, definitely go and volunteer. And if that first volunteer experience wasn't something that you that interests you, medicine is huge. Medicine is a massive field. I I had no idea, even until I was a resident, how expansive medicine could be. And so I encourage you and I invite you to maybe try to volunteer somewhere else or to volunteer in something that may seem completely boring to you within the medical aspect. It may be something that actually is very interesting to you. Wow, that's great advice. And one of our previous guests, Greg Chang, he's in the medical world as well. And one thing he did, which I thought was really cool, is he actually had two internships while he was in college. One of them was along the two different paths. So he kind of felt both of them out at the same time as an intern. So I thought that was pretty cool. So that's great advice. Now, do you have any current projects you're working on that you would like to share? Yes, I would. And I just wanted to say one really quick thing sure. too, is that to also to, even as a physician, your work isn't done. You know, going into the field of medicine, you'll be a forever student, but there are so many aspects of medicine to study. And so actually right now I'm pursuing my executive MBA through Cornell and I'm the only MD in my class. There are a few MDs in the class above me, but it's really, really interesting. And that's something too that I plan on using um, to really cause instrumental change within the medical system. And so Again, that's just to my point that what you think of medicine isn't just blood and guts. You can really expand your knowledge within medicine and, and apply it however you see fit once you have that fundamental knowledge. But one thing that I am working on and uh, that you know I think is really exciting is uh, through the Committee of Interns and Residents, we will be putting forward a, a National Bill of Rights for Residents. Um, so it's our Residency Bill of Rights that really goes through what we deem are necessary basic rights for all employees in the medical field, especially our resident physicians. And we will be getting endorsements for this from different local and national politicians, as well as national specialty societies. And so it's something to look out for. Um, and also to a, a reminder of you um, that if you are interested in medicine and, and public policy and politics, there's also that avenue for you too. Oh, that's great advice. And where can they learn more about this? So you can visit our, um, our CIR website. So we are the Committee of Interns and Residents. Our website is www.cirseiu.org. So that stands for the Committee of Residents, SEIU, and we'll be posting that as well as all of our exciting updates that we have around the country with our different residency programs. Well, you just took us on your career journey, and as with most journeys, success largely depends on reliable transportation, and we don't know each other, but I'm a huge car enthusiast, <laughs> and could you tell me, what was your first car? So I, too, love cars. Uh, so my first car, technically, was an excursion. Uh, which oh. is a massive car. I don't even think it's still on the market, um, but it was a diesel because I have three sisters and we normally were a household of eight people, at least at any given time. So I needed to learn <laughs> how to drive a truck. Um, once I showed that I could parallel park that, I was able to get my first car, which was a Jeep Wrangler. Oh, nice. Yeah. It was yeah. a 2006 white Jeep Wrangler. It looked just like Cher's car and Clueless. <laughs> <laughs> That's all that mattered, right? Oh, yes, totally. <laughs> well, now, what is your dream car if you have one? So my dream car is, um, so I, I do have one, is a 1976 Corvette Stingray. Um, it was the last year of the Stingrays, and it looks very similarly to Speed Racer's Mach 5. So I ideally would like to get one of those and paint it white. Yeah, and that's actually the most uh, specific dream car we've ever had. So I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I know cool. a thing too around. Right, around. <laughs> right, right. Well, one perk to some jobs is a company car. So if I had all the money in the world, I'd love to buy you a cool company car based on your job. 
And so I went the union route. So I nice. thought, all right, well, which car company was the first one to sign a union contract? And do you know that offhand? I do not. So see that? You can learn something on this I, show. I, I, um, yeah. So Ford signed the first union contract with the UAW in 1941. They did not want to do it. And it was quite contentious at the time. But they saw it coming. So they signed it in 1941. There are not really that many exciting 1941 Fords, but they also own Lincoln. And there are some pretty cool Lincolns. So I picked for you a 1941 Lincoln Continental Convertible, which is gorgeous. And that's the car I would pick for you as your cool company car. That is so cool. Like I, I, I literally <laughs> gasped. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I will definitely send you a picture of your cool company car when this posts. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking us on your journey today. What's the best way our listeners can learn more about you and your company? Well, you already mentioned your company. Is there anything else that you would like to put out there? Hi, and you can find me on LinkedIn searching for Linda Alvarez, MD, um, all of our young entrepreneurs. Beef up your LinkedIn profiles. It is the biggest free asset you can have in, in networking. Oh, that's great advice. Well, thank <laughs> you so much for taking us on your career journey today, Linda. No, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to Learn From Others, where we help others succeed by sharing success. Where will our next adventure take us? Subscribe to find out. If you know of someone who has a cool career story or occupation, contact Greg through Instagram at Greg Stanley LFO. That's G-R-E-G-S-T-A-N-L-E-Y-L-F-O. And we will see you soon as we learn from others together.